um, research support section. Um, I'll be your host today. My name is Deb Tushweda, and we um here um hosting this um seminar to you. We have presenters, two presenters have been indicated there, myself and uh, Mr. Uh, Stephen Visahi. Mr. Stephen Visahi is a, a research or oh, is a faculty librarian. Um, most uh, especially uh, respons responsible for human sciences and education. So while um, maybe you are waiting a few minutes, I think we can start now. We don't want to delay those ones that have been here already for a long time. I want to give a floor to our first presenter, Mr. Stephen Visaki, who's going to present to us uh, or to take us through the presentation on uh, citation score, score as a um, measure of uh, scientific uh, reputation. Um, Mr. Visaki, uh, the floor of uh, the floor is yours. Yes, the virtual floor is mine. Thank you very much, Tatia. So yes, I'm Stephen Fasaki. I'm a research and faculty support librarian, mostly for the humanities and social sciences. But yes, I do have an interest in research. So let me just get my presentation going. So what I will do is I'll do a slideshow, but hopefully we'll be able to, um, if this time, take you to some live things or answer some questions afterwards. So which citation scores should be you be using as a measurement of your scientific reputation? And we're going to deal mostly with the three most common ones. We'll be looking at Google Scholar, how they do citation scoring, ResearchGate has their version and Scopus as well. You get a uh, Web of Science as well. We don't subscribe to that, but Web of Science and Scopus are pretty much similar in the way that they score uh, uh, articles and research by uh, you guys. So let's take a look further. Author impact. An author's impact on their field or discipline has traditionally been measured using the number of times their academic publications are cited by other researchers. So it's an internal thing. How many times are researchers looking at you, your work and how many times are you looking at others' work, you know, using their, citing their work in your own work and so forth. It's a whole network. There are numerous algorithms that account for such things as the recency of the publication or poorly or highly cited papers. While citation metrics may reflect the impact of research in the field, there are many potential biases within these measurements and they should be used with care. OK, so the most commonly accepted uh, uh, scoring method inside uh, research is the H index. So H, I presume, comes from the person who came up with it, Hirsch, in 2005, and it has become the leading measure for quantifying the impact of a scientist's publish, published work. The H index is prominently featured in citation databases such as Google Scholar, Scopus and Web of Science. Now, each of them do employ the H index algorithm. However, the results can be differ different from Scholar, Scopus and Web of Science, or let's say Scholar and Scopus, because those are the ones we have access to. It's funny how using the algorithm, H, in H index for algorithm in Scholar, always still gives a higher score than in Scopus. And we'll talk about that just now. The H index equals the numbers of papers H with a citation number greater than or equal to H. Sounds confusing, but it's basically an, an example. A scientist with an H index of 37 has 37 papers cited at least 37 times. So it could happen, for instance, that a researcher has put out 100 papers, another one has put out 50, and the one who's put out 50 could have a higher H score, all due to them having being cited more times uh, uh, than the, the other person. Now, what are the advantages of an H index? It allows for direct comparisons within disciplines, and this is important. You will notice, for instance, if you look at the H index of someone in engineering or IT, and you look at the H indexes of people in the social sciences or in you know, English languages and so forth, they're far higher in the technical side, in the STEM side. Um, that is just... Uh, the way it is, more people are going to be citing important papers on that side, whereas English and, uh, you know, the, the, the social sciences are more broadly spread. So you must not never compare 
when it comes to research is compare out of different disciplines. Always compare within the same discipline to see how people are doing. Measure quantity and impact by a single value. So yes, a single value will give you an idea of quantity and number. Disadvantages of the H index. Let's just see how these people waiting in the lobby. Uh, disadvantages does not give an accurate measure for early career researchers. If you're just starting out, it's going to take a while for you to build up that H index because you have to get a certain number of papers out there before it really starts reflecting well. Calculated by using only articles that are indexed in Web of Science, if a researcher publishes an article in a journal that is not indexed by Web of Science, the article, as well as any citations to it, will not be included in the H index. This is why it is so important to publish your articles in credible accredited journals that are listed, uh, indexed by people like Scopus, by Web of Science, by Directory of Open Access Journals, and so forth. Because if you just go for these I'm not saying all journals are predatory, but the uncredited ones, that's not going to do anything to improve your H index, your scoring. It's going to go by the wayside. And, at, you know, at the end of the day, has it proved, proven any value to you in your career? The other index I want to look at is called the I10 index. This was created by Google Scholar and used in Google's My Citations feature. So the I10 index is equal to the number of publications with at least 10 citations. This is very simple measure is only used by Google Scholar and is another way to help gauge the productivity of, of a scholar. Advantages of I10 index, it's very simple and straightforward to calculate. And my citations in Google Scholar is free and easy to use. Disadvantages of the I10 index, it's used only in Google Scholar. Now, the problem I have with the I10 index versus the H index is H index is very strict about the kind of journals from which it collects information. Whereas with Google Scholar, it's Google Scholar is driven mostly by an artificial intelligence. So it picks up a lot of sideline things, it doubles a lot of things, you know, it picks up things that perhaps shouldn't be there. So while it's not a Bad scale, it's not a perfectly accurate scale, but at, uh, compared to some others, there are worse ones. So uh, another thing, difference between the two is, is with your H index, um, Scopus, for instance, automatically extracts your H index and information from articles you've published in journals that they've indexed. You don't have to do anything else. However, to really start building up an I10 index, you need to register yourself a profile on Google Scholar. So you have to go and put in your information and then once you, you've you done that, you'll start seeing a, a index, an I10 index against your name. Let's move on. So my citations in Google Scholar, the benefits, it's free, it's fast, it will most likely offer a higher number of documents which have cited a work. So it might pick up some of those journals that would not be indexed for instance, by Scopus or Web of Science. So, you know, it might sneak in some predatory stuff there as well. It offers an almost unlimited universe of content. Whatever has been cited by another work on the web can be collected by Google and will be in Google Scholar. So whether you've cited a book or a blog or anything out there, just about not just pure peer reviewed journal articles, it could be picked up by uh, Google Scholar. Google Scholar cons, there is no standardization of author names. So sometimes if your name has changed, either you got married or in a different language journal or something like that, or you've just used an initial, it might not be picking all your items up. Okay, so there's no standardization of author names. So you may have to search multiple variations of a name to find works written by an individual. Anything cited by another article, whether scholarly or not, will be included in the time cited list. This can include blog posts, syllabi, or anything else mentioned in a scholarly article. As so I've mentioned that before, every version of an article is included in search results. So they are likely, be likely to be duplicate entries for the same article and the times cited count may also include duplicates. So say for instance, you've published your article in a journal, but you put a early version of that article into your local um, a non-Google repository, for instance, or other repository, 
Google Scholar, being a computer, will pick them both up and list both of them. And that won't be a true reflection because according to Scopus, they would only pick up the one that was published in a journal. Google Scholar provides only very basic citation analysis options compared with reports and tools available from Scopus and Web of Science. And if there's time, we can take a look at some of those things. Now, here's an example of a profile on Google Scholar. And I've got, yeah, if you haven't heard of him, you've probably lived under a bush for the last two years, but this is the profile for Dr. Anthony Fauci, the, the sort of the godfather of the uh, COVID. Uh, he was the one speaking from the White House and giving out information. He's a very well respected man in this field. He's incredibly published. He is uh, in his 70s, so he's had a long time to build up his career. And if you look at his scores, you look at his citations, I hope it's not too small yet, but in the top right corner, he's got over 228,000 citations that's in his life. But just in the last five years, and I think COVID really gave him a boost, he's at over 50,000 citations. Now, according to the H index, he's got an incredible lifetime H index score of 228. And since 2017, he's got a score of 92. That's only his last five years worth of uh, publications. His I10 index, which is the Google Scholar one, He's got 1,116 for life and 491 for the last five years. And here you can see, according to this bar graph, especially it's very telling that during 2020 and 2021, he was really boosted. He was cited a lot, up to 11,000 times per year. And uh, then you get information about his articles, they'll list his articles. Uh, by the highest citation going down and in which year that article was. Now, he didn't get this profile automatically. He had to go in and uh, uh, create it as any of you would have to do as well if you wanted to check your uh, I-10 index. Now, of course, I put him there. We can't expect to compete with people like uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, but uh, I tried to look at one of our top researchers, uh, Michael Mutingi from Engineering, and he's got a very respectable uh, profile if you look on Google Scholar. So you can see all time he's got uh, 1,388 citations, uh, 790 in the last five years. It's very good. His H index is, let's say, just look, let, look at the last five years, it's 13, and his I10 index is 21. Compared to Anthony Fauci, yes, this looks small, but compared to the rest of NAS, this is a very good score. He's done really well for himself. And we can see also by the bar graph, graph how he has become more and more. He's built his reputation. His papers are being cited more and more. Of course, 2022 will be low because we're only halfway through the year. But for 2021, he had a very decent uh, number of uh, citations there. And once again, we can see all his articles by popularity, how many times they've been cited first going on down okay i'm gonna look okay so now let's talk about research gate i'm gonna tell you straight from the front research gate use it as a social media platform don't look for a uh, research gate to give you a proper score so researchgate.net is an academic profile and social networking site and a popular hub on the web for sharing academic publications it revolves around research papers, a question and answering system, and a job board. If you're looking for a job, ResearchGate might be one of the places. So it's got value. I, I'm not saying ResearchGate doesn't have value. It has great value. If you want to be on, on there, that's great. Please do. Researchers are able to create a profile that showcases their publication record and their academic expertise. And that's what uh, research today is about, is you have to be a self-promoter. You need to put your name out there. Uh, whether you're looking for uh, research funding, whether you're looking for co-authors at other universities, you need to make yourself known. Okay, and ResearchGate is one of the tools you can use. Other users are then able to follow these profiles and are notified of any updates. Researchers say that they signed up for ResearchGate because they received an email. I think that's why I signed up as well. I somehow got caught on a mailing list. And uh, but of course, I don't have any publications against my name, so I've just got my profile up there. ResearchGate is a private company attempting to monetize academic publishing, and it does not vet whether it has a license to host the publication. 
So first of all, they're making money, but that's the same for Facebook. That's the same for Instagram. That's the same for Twitter. These companies don't do it for the love of it. They do it to make money. So ResearchGate, it's not funny that they're strange that they're trying to make money. And but you, what you do notice is, is you find a lot of articles uploaded onto ResearchGate. I've benefited from that when I've been looking for articles for researchers that have approached me and stuff like that. But I'm just warning you, if you're going to upload articles, your articles onto ResearchGate, make sure you're not messing with copyright with the journal. If the journal gives you public uh, permission or if you're using a pre-publication uh, version of your article, that's different. But if you're grabbing the articles from your journal and re loading them onto ResearchGate, you might be causing problems for yourself. Let me just move on. OK, so what is the ResearchGate score? The RG score indicates how your work is received by your peers. RG uh, believes that researchers are the best judges of each other's work and that all a person's research, published or not, deserves credit. With this in mind, your RG score is calculated based on any contribution you share on ResearchGate or add to your profile, such as published articles, unpublished research projects, questions and answers. So there we really see problems like unpublished research being added and affecting the score. That shouldn't be happening because it's not being peer reviewed. Uh, the RG algorithm looks at how your peers receive and evaluate those contributions and who they are. The higher the RG score of those who interact with your research, the more you, your own score will increase. A low quality contribution probably won't attract positive feedback and recognition from the community, so it won't contribute to your score in any significant way. How the RG score gets calculated is vague and it's not transparent. This has been the big com uh, complaint against the RG score from the beginning, since they started it in 2012. This is something I pulled from a journal uh, article from 2015 by Cracker, Jordan and Lex. The results of our evaluation of the RG score were rather discouraging. While there are some innovative ideas in the way ResearchGate approached the measure, we also found that the RG score ignores a number of fundamental bibliometric guidelines and that ResearchGate makes basic mistakes in the way the score is calculated. We deem these shortcomings to be so problematic that the RG score should not be considered as a measure of scientific reputation in its current form. What does that mean? If you're trying to promote yourself, trying to apply for a new job, don't use your RG score. It's, it's not respected. Okay. ResearchGate's article views have low to moderate correlations with scope of citations. Okay. However, I went online, I was looking at the ResearchGate uh, website and there is a new development that is going to be very interesting. Okay. But let's first look at Michael Mutingi's uh, ResearchGate score. They do give his age index, they are 15, and they say citations and so they give, so they do give a score of, yeah, 21.09. However, importantly, under news, it says here, we will remove the RG score from ResearchGate after July 2022. So why is ResearchGate getting rid of their scoring system? I went further and looked for some information. What did we learn from the RG score? The RG score was released in 2012 as a way for our members. OK, let me see if I can just jump to the important information. On the flip side, some members were, were frustrated with the RG scores in transparency and with their research impact being bound to a single metric. We also heard from members who reported fluctuations in this score that they couldn't explain. At the same time, we have been following the movement within the academic community towards responsible use of research metrics and a more holistic approach to assessing research impact. So through all of this, we recognize that despite the benefits of the RG score, well, they would say that because it's ResearchGate provided to our members, we could still do better. And while all metrics usually only describe a particular facet or view and don't tell the full story about the interest in a researcher's work, we believe that there is place for better metrics and indicators on ResearchGate to support the community. So the new approach is that they're getting rid of the RG score. What they're going to be looking at in the future is uh, to help facilitate start a defining set of criteria that we strive to follow for our metrics to move forward. 
Intuitive, we strive to make our metrics intuitive to understand so that you can apply, use them responsibly to make them transparent so that everyone knows how that score was calculated. How did that number come about? We strive to make the calculation inputs of metrics transparent for everyone, robust. We strive to make our metrics difficult to artificially manipulate or influence or to not experience disruptive calculation changes over time. We know the kind of world we live in where you've got bots and things that could be used to manipulate anything from the news to scores. So this is good uh, indicator this and relevant. We strive to not show our metrics out of context, pushing for their responsible use and to always provide the right context to metrics. OK, so unfortunately, the RG score doesn't meet some of these criteria. After considering these points together with the community feedback, we'd made the decision to remove the RG score. So what's next? They're going to be looking at a different scoring called research interest, but they are still now they're going to start including the H index. The H index will be their scoring. They'll have a different one called research interest, which is a more of an altmetric kind of uh, way of measuring things. But thankfully, they'll be using the formula for H index. OK, so that answers it immediately about research, because when I started this, I thought there was going to be a bit of a debate. A lot of people love ResearchGate. Now we're getting the information from ResearchGate themselves that the score was never really worth that much. OK. Scopus. Now, Scopus is the, the, the standard, as well as Web of Science, but we subscribe to Scopus and not to Web of Science. Web of Science is quite expensive. So Scopus, in case you didn't know, is a citation database. It's considered to be the largest citation database in the world. What does it mean when we call it a citation database? Is that it cites just about every article published in their index journals out there. It's a lot, millions we're talking about, but it does not provide full text. It will give you a link to the, uh, the, the, the databases that do, and if we subscribe to it, you can get in full text, but don't expect to find full text articles in Scopus. What is great about Scopus is because it's so big, it has great analytical tools for analyzing research and researchers. Uh, can you just mute? Thanks. Uh, no extra effort other than publishing in a credible journal indexed by Scopus. That's all you have to do. You don't have to make a profile or anything like that. Just make sure you publish in a credible journal that uh, Scopus indexes. And they, they're pretty thorough about who they index, but they've got a lot of journals in there. You know, there's no shortage. If you go through their list of index journals, you will definitely find a journal in your field that you can publish in. No need to create. OK, so there we got no need to create profiles. Scopus works directly with the journals and extracts the data from there. So no in between, nothing in between. They do their own extraction. All research should be published in a journal indexed by Scopus. Well, not just Scopus. I would say if you're doing, for instance, uh, open, uh, uh, open. Uh, let me see, uh, a journal that's free, uh, uh, open access. A lot of open access journals are in Scopus as well. Okay. So what you can do is maybe look for a journal in the directory of open access journals and stuff, double check, but you can do free uh, art, uh, open access publishing within Scopus. Scopus includes both those that are paid and those that are free. Most universities in use Scopus for citation analysis and research impact measurement. OK. And it has a long, why does someone, or an organization like NUST prefer that you published in uh, uh, indexed Scopus indexed uh, journals because that can generate an H index okay, for yourself, but collectively it creates a scoring for the institution as well, all the researchers within NUST. And that is one of the ways that uh, NUST can improve its uh, profile in the world. If we ever want to get onto that list of the top uh, universities, in the world or in Africa, we've got to do the right things according to, uh, we've got to follow the rules if we want to climb that. And that is means publishing the right way, okay? Let's take a look here. Let me go to next page, okay. Now this was, we've anonymized it, we've removed the names, but this was a, a couple of years ago, they did a, um, how should I say, a survey of the uh, lecturers in departments. This is just one department. I'm not going to say which one it is or who the people are, but we were looking at, for instance, 
how did they did they show up in Scopus? Did they show up in Google Scholar or did they show up in ResearchGate? And we'll see that ResearchGate is very popular. Uh, most people have a profile in ResearchGate. Whether they are managing that profile properly by adding all their research information and stuff like that, I can't tell you. But everyone uh, seems to be there. So from a social media kind of view, that's 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 a positive thing. But that also means a lot of people are going to be taking their uh, ResearchGate scores at face value, and that's not a good thing. If we looked at Google Scholar, sadly we found that just about no one had gone and created a profile for themselves in Google Scholar, and it's not difficult. It's very easy to do. Uh, we'll see an example just now. So that was uh, disappointing. And then in Scopus, look here, Dr. C.R., quite prominent on ResearchGate, no publications listed on Scopus. Why is that? That means Dr. C.R. probably only published in journals that weren't totally credible. I don't know how to state it any other way, or hadn't yet been credited, or hadn't made the effort to get uh, be credible enough for Scopus. And that is just a waste, because that means this could be publications that were hard work, could be very good articles, but just because of the failing of the journal, it means very little when it comes to creating a, 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 a citation score. And we see this. Dr. V had one article on Scopus, but he had an H index of zero, because one article doesn't mean that much. Dr. G, six articles on Scopus, he's got an H index of three. There we go, that's going in the right directions. But you see a lot of the people have no publications listed on Scopus. And this is something we need to fix around the university to get people to start creating profiles in Google Scholar, to start publishing in credible journals so they appear in the Scopus index, and then also doing things like joining Awkward and putting all their research in there as well. Because all these go toward not just benefiting yourself, but going to benefit the institution as well. And also, if you want to move jobs, People are going to be looking at Scopus and seeing if they can find you. And if you're not there, it's going to just make it so much harder for you to qualify for that next position. And also for research funding, research funders are going to be looking at things like what is your age index? Let's move on. Sorry. Now, yeah, I've gone and I've gone and looked at uh, our valuable researcher, Dr. Michael Matingi, on uh, uh, um, uh, Scopus, and thank God he's there. So that means he publishes in good journals. And what we can do is, I don't know if you can see it up here, it says author H index 13. So he's got a very respectable, in Scopus, which is tough, score of 13. Now, if I remember correctly, in Google Scholar, he had an H index of 15. Why the difference? Because they, even though Google Scholar used the H index formula, they included too many things that shouldn't have been included. That gave him a higher score. Scopus is more strict. They're gonna be looking at good journals, peer reviewed journals only, and things like the peer reviewed books, but that affects the scoring. So he's got a good scoring of 13 over there. We can see that lately his citations, especially in 2021, 22 is not finished yet, but 21, he's got almost 110 citations for his articles. And then below, they will start listing all his articles by popularity, and you can see by year which which years they scored their, their citations in. That is a look at a profile uh, of our research, one of our researchers in Scopus, and he didn't have to create this profile. It was automatically generated by him and his articles in good journals. I've got a I thought I for uh, interest sake, I'd add Professor Rolf Becker as well. He's also here on uh, Scopus. He's got 13 cited documents. He's got an H index of five, and five is not bad. Trust me, it, it takes a long time to get there. Um, and shows his articles as well, and when he was getting his most citations, which he is, and so forth. So, and there are other valuable tools built into Scopus. If you ever want a tour through Scopus, go through by yourself or ask a librarian to take you through. It is a great tool for analyzing research. Let's carry on. OK, and then just for fun, I thought I'd look at the good Dr. Anthony Fauci on, on uh, uh, Scopus. He's got an H index of 185. I mean, but he's a superstar. It would be like trying to look up uh, Einstein's uh, profile here. Um, uh, and then we can see how high. I mean, 
almost what almost just below 6,000 citations in 2021 out of his 1,181 articles. Oops, sorry. And we can see his articles here. But remember, this is a man who's probably just under 80 and he's been doing this for 40 years. And he has done all the right things, been involved in the right research, published in the right journals, gone to the right conferences and stuff like that. And it's a STEM field, so of course it's going to be very high. But yeah. It's always good to look at those who do better because it makes us strive harder as well. Okay, conclusion. So as per the evaluation, and I hope you agree with me, it's been concluded that research case score should not be considered in the evaluation of academics in its current form. And yes, as we've seen, they're busy changing their, their, their system. That NUST should make a firm stance or commitment on using an analytical tool like Scopus or something else of equal quality like Web of Science as a requirement. As an institution, we should be using Scopus to evaluate the research impact of our researchers. All research should be published in a journal indexed by a trustworthy index like a Director of Open Access Journals or Scopus, Web of Science, or if you're an educationalist, the, by Eric. And if a lecturer is not sure, a librarian can insist in making sure. And that, let me just stop sharing. I hope provide some insight. If there are any questions uh, anyone has, I'd be glad to take them now. Otherwise, if not, I just quickly want to do a live demo where I take you through to the library's website and show you where you can find some things, if you don't mind. So let me just show you my screen again. I'm going to be looking at... Oh, wait, let me first minimize this. Okay, share. Let's go here. So let's go to the library's website. So if you want to know where you can find accredited journals, we we'll see that recently we've added you under announcements, NUST accredited journals. Click on there. It goes and explains, gives you some explanations about publishing in journals. Um, and then it talks about uh, NUST has identified indices that deem to contain accredited journals and is encouraging its researchers to publish in journals that appear in the below indices. So here we see uh, indexes provided by Web of Science. You can look at them. So there's the science citation, the social sciences citation, the arts and humanity citation and emerging sources. It gives you a link to Scopus. Uh, it gives you a link to the South African Department of Higher Education and Training. They provide, let's see, it does a quick download. There's a spreadsheet you can download and you can see journals that they have accredited. Why would the South African uh, Department of Higher Education Training be accrediting journals? Because in South Africa, the government pays research departments for research that comes out of there. So if you publish an article that is received well in a journal that is approved by them, money actually comes to the department, which can then be employed for further research and so forth. So it's very important. So they're quite strict uh, about which journals they allow before they start paying out money. But you'll see that this correlates very closely to what you see in Scopus as well and other uh, um, of these lists. Close that again. Um, there's other ones like Math SciNet, ZipMath, Directory of Open Access Journals, if you want to publish open access, and Silo in South Africa. Let's just click on Scopus quickly. Here we see Scopus' list of accredited journals. And there we go, we see it's quite long. Uh, these are the ones that they accepted recently in May 2022. You see, for instance, that they keep their discontinued titles. Say, for instance, a journal was doing well, doing all the right things, and then they uh, something happened and they started uh, performing poorly. Then Scopus will actually remove them as well. You'll see conference proceedings. If you're looking for a, a conference to attend where your research, your paper that you present will count towards uh, your score, look at there and so forth. So you can find this all down to be downloaded. If you want to search it, just control F and you can search a specific journal. See if it's in the list. If not, then I would think twice about publishing in that journal. OK, 
Okay, let me minimize this. I don't want to go too far because I'm sure uh, 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 Tatu wants to touch on some of this stuff as well. But yes, I, that's my part. If anyone has a question, or if you have a question afterwards, please feel free to contact me and I can try and answer your questions. But uh, do you, are you in agreement that uh, Scopus is the measure we should be looking at? I hope so. Or at least go and create yourself a profile on Google Scholar. Anyway, Tati. Yes, I see Thank I have a hand you. there. I have uh, a hand. Let me just check. My yes. apologies. Ah. Yes, morning. Mr. Karan. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, sorry, Dr. Tatu. Uh, Stefan, I just wanted to, I slightly came on late. You were mm -hmm. talking about the H in index. Mm -hmm. Do you mind just um, touching on it a little bit again for yes, my understanding? Certainly. Thank you. I did just go to the top of the presentation. Let's go to, yeah, the H index. So H index was proposed proposed by someone named Hirsch in 2005 and has become the leading measure for quantifying the impact of a scientist published work. This, across the scientific community there it's gotten a good reputation. The H index is prominently featured in citation databases such as Google Scholar, Scopus and Web of Science and now we see ResearchGate as well. So the formula is basically a uh, number of papers H with a citation equal to or greater than H. I'm not a mathematician, so I'm not going to try and explain that. But basically, for instance, a scientist with an H index of 37 has 37 papers cited, or at least 37 times. So uh, yeah, so what happens is the more papers you publish and the more of them that have high citations together, that's going to combine and create your H index. So yeah, the H index allows for, uh, it measures quantity and impact by single value. But as I mentioned earlier, if you're starting out as a researcher, it's not great because it takes a while for you to build up an H index reputation. You won't from for year one already have a score, most likely. Okay, I hope that helps, Mr. Karan. Thank you, yes. Okay. Um... Okay, thank you very much, um, Stephen. Thank you very much for the very informative presentation. Colleagues, is there any question? And thank you, uh, Mr. Caron, for that question. Is there any question uh, or everything is clear when it's, it comes to publication? Um, yes, there's a hand from Dr. Tuandu Colin. Yeah, yes. mine is just simple. I, I just wanted to know whether the presentation will be shared. Okay, yes, the, the presentation will be shared, but we have also recorded the um, the seminar. The seminar is also recorded, and the presentation is, is will also be available for everyone who have attended or, yeah, to be available, definitely. Okay, anyone else? Okay, it looks like there's no, there are no questions okay, from my side. Um, I was also supposed to, to take, uh, my part was, was I, I supposed to take you through the, uh, where to publish, um, reputable journals where to publish, but Stephen has done that already. It's on, it's available on the website. We don't have a presentation for that, but it's available on the library website. When you go there, you'll be able to see it and just go through, take your time, and uh, you'll be able to see what type of uh, way you can, you can actually uh, be able to publish and avoid places where you publish and that will not be uh, boost up your scientific reputation. I've seen from the uh, Stephen um, uh, presentation whereby a certain doctor have actually um, have articles, 17 articles on research gate and no citations from scopus so for me to i would say that it is a bit of a worst that because that person will end up having about 200 citations even 500 but when you go to scopus that um, most of the university they use to assess or measure there will be nothing so yeah i hope um from today we'll be, uh, we'll be able to avoid um 
um, journals or uh, publishing in places that will not boost up or will not give us credit on uh, reputable or scientific reputation and so on. Um, yes, uh, that was it from my side. Then the presentation will be made available. I have the, the name of all the um, attendees here. I'll forward the, the presentation to you, but it's also available on the record. And with that, yes, um, have, we have a hand from Nalusha. Yes, Soma. Soma, you have a hand up. Okay, uh, good morning, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Shweda. I uh, was just uh, thinking if maybe Master Risa, he can uh, take us through how to create uh, an account on Google Scholar, or maybe he did it, I just missed it somehow. Oh. Uh, Steven? Yes, yes, I could do that if, if others don't oh. mind. Let me just share my screen quickly and go to a browser. Let's go to what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to Google it. I'm going to say uh, research uh, profile Google Scholar Google Scholar profiles. Click there, and then we see do we have uh, set up your Google Scholar profile? Click there. And then all you do is you fill in your name, your affiliation, email verification, areas of interest, homepage, if you have a homepage, or put the university's homepage or your department's homepage. Um, but it's very easy. And then you can go and you can you see the, the uh, how you do it. One is profile, two is articles, and then there's certain settings. For instance, there might be settings you have around privacy or so forth. So forth, very similar to how you would do in ORCID. So if I, for instance, now just go to Google Scholar and I'm just going to search anything under the sun. Um, I'm going to say smart energy systems. And then you'll see, for instance, the names yeah, that are underlined. See, look at this one here. I'm just going to see this last one here. This uh, you'll see that some of the names are not underlined. And if I put my browser over them, it doesn't uh, act like a link. So those people don't have Google profiles. But then I see C Yan does. So if I click there, it takes me to change to Yan's profile, and I can see all his information and all his articles. So out of all these people. Mr. Yen is the only smart one because I can only see his uh, 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 work, body of work and his H uh, index score, but none of the others. But we can see that a lot of people have started creating profiles. Most of these names are underlined. So I could click on H Wenzel and I could see Henrik Wenzel from the Denmark. I can see his score. He's got an H index of 40. Wow, 31. He's, he's pretty well known. Um, and you can see all his articles and all of his articles are linked. You can see the citation scored here, here on the side. So if I did this, clicked on his citation score, I could see all the articles that used him as a citation that referenced his work. So that is also great if you want to, you know, a, a great way of doing a sideways search on a topic. Um, but also something else I want to show you is, is if you want to look quickly at how cited an article is they do give that information right under there cited by 667. so you that is also you know especially for a student a postgraduate student that's doing a, uh, a, a literature survey or something like that these things are important you can do it in scopus as well but you can also you know if i'm going to look at an article with 142 or an article with 981 I'm going to give more attention to these articles because these are probably going to be better well known. They're going to be known by the supervisor of the student, most likely in that field. And uh, uh, they call the big voices, and that's a great way of identifying big voices. But yes, I hope you, you asked about creating a profile. I hope that was able to help. OK. So, Ma, is that OK? Yes, it's fine. Thank you. 
All right. So I have questions here on the on the chat board. We have a question from uh, Mr. Chamba. Could you send the website link, please? Which website link is this, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chamba? Mr. Chamba, which website link is this? Please, um, you can, if you cannot talk, you can just text and give me a, some guidance. And we have also a question from Namutua. Who, who are the centers and units librarian or only faculty, faculties have librarians? Okay, yeah, uh, me, uh, the, uh, the person who's speaking now, Tertu, um, the one who's assigned to centers and units. Uh, yes, I assist or I do. Uh, I'm assigned to the, to, to the I, 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 I can help you. You can send me your um, queries. Yes, um, will there be other seminars in future? Yes, we, we okay, this, this seminar, is, we do it every year. It's actually a vacational um, seminar. We do it uh, when, during the holiday. Um, the, during this time, and we can only do it once because if you plan it to have around about December vacation, we 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 afraid maybe we won't have um, more. I mean, enough attendant attendance because we think maybe everyone will be um, on the mood of the holiday and everything. But we used to have it in, uh, during this time every year. Yes, definitely will be other seminars in the future. Yes, and also please suggest topics. And also, please suggest topics. Write to us. Um, I think my email is there on the on the my email is there on the poster. You can send, drop me an email, and you can uh, suggest topics. Um, yeah, of discussion that interest you. Um, I'm still waiting from um, Chiamba, and I think he's still here. Oh, he left. Maybe he left already. I am sorry, I could not pick up this um, on time. I wanted to get to know which link of the website he was talking about, but it looks like he, was, he had left already. Okay, with that, colleagues, if there's no any question or any comment, then okay, how can he has uh, replied? Where will we find the presentation that referred 